gentlemen, moving on to the next plenary session of Social Business Day 2021 on the topic of sports and social business. Sport has a very powerful way to bring everyone together and make a positive impact in our society. In 2016, Professor Yunus addressed the 129th IOC session in Rio and thus initiated the reflection about coupling the power of sport and the practical tool that is social business to create a meaningful change in people's lives. Our next plenary, Social Business and Sport Around the World is hosted by Yunus Sports Hub. And we are going to have a succession of video calls to those who shape the sport and social business movement on the field, aiming to show the latest social business developments all across the globe in live action. To moderate the session, I would like to invite my friends from the Yunus Sports Hub family, Iwan, Joko, Clement, Abby, Sophia, and Marisa. Over to you, Tim. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon. It is a great pleasure to be with you today. Um, and once again, uh, a happy 20 plus birthday to Professor Yunus uh, and uh, a very happy uh, Social Business Day to all of you who are joining us today. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Yuan Noguier. I'm the co founder and managing director of Yunus Sports Hub. And for those who do know me, I am the boring guy that uh, mainly speaks about sport and social business. <laughs> Um, as uh, Shazib was introducing before, in 2016, uh, Professor Yunus uh, um, uh, introduced somehow to the sport movement uh, the social business concept and the microcredit concept. And uh, 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 while doing so, he basically initiated a reflection from all of these people around the world that say that sport has a super powerful transformational uh, uh, aspect and that this very practical tool that is social business can actually help us uh, uh, to create a real difference in the society. Uh, since then, over the years, the, the Unisports Hub has been created and, and we are basically in charge to steer this task force and uh, to steer this, uh, 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 to consolidate this movement. And along the way, by chance, many other amazing organizations, many other uh, amazing people uh, have also joined uh, 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 this uh, this effort, and and the reason why you have seen on this uh, on this panel picture that there are so many people with with us today is because we have tried to go a bit beyond what we generally do with a standard panel, uh, and we have tried to be uh, to be a bit innovative. The first uh, reason for that is so so the first way we we have tried to be innovative is by having not only myself as a moderator but. Uh, all of the Unisports Hub team that is working on these uh, on these uh, amazing uh, with these amazing people. Uh, the other way is that we will not be a three or four like a standard panel, but ten people. So it will be quick fire, quick statement of all of these people that have something very important to say in the sense of sport and social business. And finally, uh, we will get the chance to get pictures, actual pictures from the field with players that are actually on the ground. Uh, and show uh, how social business is implemented on a daily basis or, of course, via, via video message when, uh, uh, when it was impossible to get some, some live action. Um, there's, a lot, there's a lot of speakers, so I will stop talking now and I will hand over to Clément, uh, who is going to start the journey around the world with Africa. Clément, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Johan. Hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be with you all today. So as Johan was saying, we're going to start our trip around the world with Africa. So the idea is just to show you images from the ground from two projects. The first one will be in, uh, in Ivory Coast, in Abidjan. And uh, Brice, which is on the ground, will show you some pictures. Brice, Brice your turn. Alors, euh, bonsoir à tous. Je parle français. Mala. Um, un plaisir, donc euh, là on va juste vous montrer un peu, euh, je ne sais pas si vous voyez mon écran, voilà, alors donc là c'est euh, le, le centre incubateur, donc vous voyez là on a mis le social business, euh, voilà, Mixing c'est you know spot up. Voilà. Alors, laissez-moi vous euh, présenter un peu à quoi ressemble euh, là où nous travaillons.
Alors, donc là, c'est l'air euh, basketball. Donc, ici, comme vous voyez, ce sont les, les bureaux euh, de médecins et Unisport Hub. Donc, euh, on essaie de descendre. Je vais descendre rapidement pour vous présenter un peu l'air de jeu pour euh, les footballeurs. Voilà. Donc, euh, c'est un cadre euh, très intéressant parce qu'on a à la fois tous les acteurs qui euh, travaillent euh, autour du sport. Donc, c'est aussi un point euh, de contact euh, avec tous les jeux qui viennent pour... Euh, Et donc, le sport permet à ces jeunes-là de, de s'approprier les valeurs du social business. Voilà. Donc, euh, voici un peu le cadre où nous travaillons au niveau de la Côte d'Ivoire. Voilà. Merci beaucoup, Brice. Thank you, Brice. So... As you did notice, it was in French, but we just wanted to show you the pictures so you have a better idea of what's happening on the ground. So um, it's a sports center where you have a lot of pitch of basketball, football, and so on. And you also have containers where we have social business. And there is an incubator. So you have a lot of young people attracted to this area and to this center, thanks to the power of sport. And then a lot of social business are launched there. And we wanted to show you a bit of the, those aspects. The second project I wanted to talk to you about today is still in Africa and it's an incubation program. So yeah, I have a video that I will just launch now with 16 athletes that will say a few words just for you to understand a bit about their project. Il s'agit d'ouvrir un village sportif en Côte d'Ivoire, un, parce que c'est mon pays d'origine, et deux, parce que c'est un pays en plein essor qui bénéficie d'une population à fort potentiel, à savoir que 60% de la population ivoirienne a entre 5 et 17 ans. Le village sportif aura pour vocation de conjuguer la nature et le sport, car il est aujourd'hui important de tenir compte des différents enjeux sociétaux et environnementaux. Mon projet il consiste tout simplement à pouvoir positionner des infrastructures sportives de proximité euh, en RDC, en ambitionnant de, de pouvoir euh, d'ici euh, les juillet 2024 en mettre euh, 100 et, euh, en donnant de l'emploi à, à, justement à ce peuple congolais. En 2009, j'ai euh, créé une association qu'on qu a appelée euh, euh, Association Club Arc de Marrakech. Euh, J'avais le souci de, de développer le sport en général, surtout dans le, le, les volets éducation et social. Euh, pour euh, résoudre des problèmes, euh, problématiques plutôt, dans le, surtout euh, avec les jeunes de, en chômage. Quoi de mieux que de me lancer dans l'entrepreneuriat et de, de travailler sur les, les écosystèmes économiques des fédérations africaines de rugby Parce que, bien sûr, je savais un peu le, les, les problématiques qu'il peut y avoir au niveau des, des fédérations africaines de rugby. Et cela m'a permis ben, vraiment de pouvoir me dire, euh, voilà, euh, de me lancer dans mon entreprise sociale business qui pourrait me permettre probablement de faire ce que j'aime et surtout ben, de pouvoir rapporter, d'apporter une pierre, je dirais, à, 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 au sport africain et au rugby en général. Mon projet, c'est de mettre en place un centre sport-études. Il euh, n'y en a pas beaucoup en Afrique et euh, dans le judo, on n'en a pas encore. Donc je souhaiterais le mettre en place pour permettre à cette belle jeunesse africaine de faire leur sport leur passion, mais de continuer à faire leur cursus scolaire, car c'est très important d'étudier. Et puis les deux, ils vont ensemble, le sport, les étudier. Donc le projet d'ailleurs, très rapidement, c'est quoi C'est un projet qui a une visée éducative. Donc à l'image de l'association que j'ai fondée il y a quelques années, on aspire à accompagner les jeunes filles euh, sur l'acquisition sur de valeurs telles la confiance en soi et l'estime de soi. Donc on pourrait dire que c'est une formation euh, en développement personnel à destination des jeunes filles euh, basée en Afrique de l'Ouest, donc dans un premier temps au Sénégal, et euh, le tout digitalisé en fait. Mon projet 4D de Jenny Boudanté s'appuie sur l'athlétisme pour sensibiliser les filles et les jeunes femmes maliennes au développement durable, c'est-à-dire à, à l'éducation, la santé et le numérique. Mon projet c'est... Euh... 
c'est de créer euh, la plus grande salle de crossfit, la plus grande salle de, de préparation physique au Congo, euh, suite à des différents événements euh, qui ont été organisés au Congo, euh, où euh, plusieurs athlètes africains ont eu du mal à, à, avoir, à obtenir une salle pour, pour s'entraîner ou pour faire des stages. Avec mon compagnon, on a décidé de créer une salle euh, au Bénin, une salle de fitness au dernier standard, euh, en tout cas européen, avec euh, des machines de dernière génération, ce qui est très rare sur le marché. Et aussi, la partie importante de mon projet, c'est qu'il y a un volet social important. Avec lui, on a élaboré des programmes pour pouvoir aider euh, certains organismes, certaines organisations à pouvoir... Euh, aider euh, la prise en charge d'enfants spécifiquement dans moi mon projet et de femmes en difficulté en phase de réinsertion sociale. Le projet consiste à la production de biogaz à travers un biodigesteur. Le biogaz est produit euh, par la fermentation des déchets organiques. Notre plateforme Tibié sera une plateforme blockchain d'investissement qui mettra en relation les investisseurs du monde entier et les talents africains, grâce à des actifs numériques plus sécures et plus liquides. J'ai pour projet de créer un centre aquatique intégré euh, au Togo, pour faire plus précisément dans la ville de Panimé. Euh, L'objectif est d'accompagner les jeunes, euh, quand je parle des jeunes, des plus petits aux plus grands, euh, vers le savoir nager. Et euh, l'objectif, c'est vraiment de créer une vraie passerelle euh, voilà, euh, entre la population et ce sport. Mon projet est le suivant. J'ai une fondation qui porte mon nom au Cameroun, qu'on s'en bat. Et nous avons décidé, après différentes actions, de pouvoir mettre en place un projet de développement de l'agriculture du poivre blanc pour créer d'abord un contenu de formation pour les personnes en situation de handicap et ensuite de l'emploi. Voilà, une première dans ce pays qui permettrait de pouvoir valoriser l'implication et le travail des personnes en situation de handicap. Mon projet se porte sur la restauration, c'est-à-dire euh, créer un food truck qui va pouvoir offrir des plats végétariens, vegan et des plats diététiques pour les, les gens qui veulent faire du poids. Et aussi à inciter les gens à manger sain, à manger équilibré, mais aussi euh, à pouvoir contrôler ce qu'ils mangent. Parce qu'on a noté beaucoup de maladies cardiovasculaires et aussi un taux d'obésité énorme au Sénégal. Mon projet Diambar Fours consiste à la mise en place d'une unité de production de jus 100% naturel et bio, fait à base de fruits et légumes, issus de l'agriculture locale, tel que le pain de singe communément appelé bouillie. 70% des métiers destinés aux femmes sera affecté aux, à celles à mobilité réduite, hormis la manutention et les métiers à force destinés aux gros bras. J'ai créé Pins Sans Frontières en 2006, ça fait plus de 15 ans. Et tout au fil de ces années, je me suis rendu compte d'un paradoxe ou en tout cas d'une difficulté majeure des, du secteur associatif. C'est la dépendance aux subventions publiques et aux dons des particuliers pour, pour faire fonctionner l'association et donc mener à bien les, les projets. De ce, constat, de ce constat, je me suis dit qu'il était nécessaire d'avoir un moyen de dégager des, des revenus propres à l'association sans dépendre intégralement des subventions ou des dons des particuliers. And that's it. That was really brief, I know, but we are a bit short of time. So we're done with Africa for now. I uh, hope you want to know a bit more about all those uh, fabulous projects. And now back to Marissa, which is going to travel with you to South America. Hello, everyone. Um, <laughs> welcome. Thank you, Clement. That was amazing to hear from all the different athletes and all about their projects. Um, as Kaman said, we are going to go to South America, but first we will take a stop in Switzerland um, where we will explore the IOC Young Leaders Program. Um, and I will share with you in a moment the interview that we've had um, with Anna Maria Garcevic of the IOC. One moment, sorry about this. All right. Great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Marissa Schlenker, and I'm the program manager at the UNIS Sports Hub. At UNIS Sports Hub, we support the delivery of the IOC Young Leaders Program, an IOC designed and funded program empowering young le leaders to leverage the power of sport and social business to make a positive difference in their communities. In just a moment, you will hear from Anna Maria Garcevich, Head of Activities at Olympic Games Engagement and the IOC Young Leaders Program lead on the IOC side. Anna, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Hi, Johan. Hi, the whole team. <laughs> <laughs> so we would like to uh, get straight to our question of interest today. Um, so I will start. So more than 3,000 young people from all corners of the globe took part in the IOC six-week sprint, which was the prerequisite for applying to the IOC Young Leaders 2021 to 2024 program. The new version of the Young Leaders program attracted a lot of interest. Can you share with us more about the newest version of the Young Leaders program and comment on its main objectives and how it aims to realize them? Thank you. Thanks, Marissa. Yes, I can definitely comment on a few of those. Well, first of all, I'm not really surprised by the interest of the young people in the program such as ours. Uh, I think you today is much more engaged and interested in social development and social initiatives in general than when I was in my 20s, which was some time ago. This is not unusual with all the social media boom happening in the last decade or so. But I also think that because of the increased access to the information, the youngsters seem to care more about social issues such as climate change, poverty and various inequalities. I'm sure you can agree with that. And they try to action their interests and concerns through various initiatives. And one of them is the IOC Young Leaders Program, as we all know, uh, which provides support to the young leaders to tackle local pro problems and issues through various grassroots initiatives and sustainable business models. Not to forget the element of sport, which also attracts many, as we all know. And it is widely known that sport is a powerful catalyst for social change and for breaking stereotypes in many areas of uh, life and business. So when you combine the two, the social business model with the sport solutions, the magic happens, which brings me to the new revamped version of the program. So the new program is an evolved version of the old program with all its best parts kept. But in 2021, we provide the young leaders with a long term development over the next four years versus previous model that worked with already fully developed ideas and projects brought to us by the young leaders. And each year of the four year program is focusing on a specific phase of developing a social business. This is the crucial change where the young leaders do not come in with their ideas already established, but it is a co-creation, co-collaboration process where a team of experts gives the necessary knowledge and tools to the young leaders to develop an idea which is in line with the Olympic values, with the sustainable development goals, and corresponds to the principle of a true social, true social business. So by the end of 2024, we hope we will have 25 new projects, which will in its own right reach another 30,000 uh, users, users uh, in quotes, or even more, let's hope for the best, uh, across the globe and touch the lives of the kids and youth and the next generation of the young leaders. And finally, it is worth noting that the IOC Young Leaders Program goes hand in hand with the IOCs and the IOC President's long-term vision and strategic roadmap, which contains commitments, commitments such as engaging with youth, engaging with various communities, spreading Olympic value-based uh, education, and ultimately strengthen the role as um, the role of sport as an important enabler for the UN Sustainable Development Goals. I hope that answers your question, Marissa. <laughs> yes, that was beyond. <laughs> that was a great response, and I think it really gave a good insight into what this new revamped program looks like. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. And
All right. So we now get a chance to actually hear from one of the IOC young leaders, uh, Krishna. I'm going to hand the ball to you. Krishna is calling in um, from Brazil, and um, she will tell us a little bit about her project and experience, her experiences as an IOC young leader. Hi, thank you, Marisa, for introducing me. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, as Marisa said, I am from Brazil. Uh, my name is Krishna, and I'm so glad and so honored to be here today. Uh, my IOC Young Leader project is called United by Sport. We seek to improve the life quality of children who live in shelters and social centers in Rio, Brazil. Uh, focusing on inspiration and inclusion through sport and the link events, we understand their reality and become part of their lives. Uh, we share knowledge about sustainability, such as waste separation, reusing and recycling items, reducing the use of plastics, explaining why we shouldn't waste natural resources, and why we take care of the nature and the world where we live. Uh, so we teach the children new healthy habits, such as taking care of their mind and their body, exercising, brushing their teeth, balancing sleep, and eating well. Uh, we also teach them the link events of friendship, excellence, and respect, and how it's possible to live better having them as guideline of everything in their lives. Mm. This is a project that was born in 2016 in this program, and we have had the opportunity to serve more than 240 children years old. Uh, we always received positive feedback from institutions. Uh, they said that the way the project impacts children really changed the way they look at life. They start to have more hope for a better life, more hope for a better world. Uh, I'm really, really happy to say that it's a small step, but it's a step for a better future. Uh, my team of volunteers and I, we believe that the inclusion of these children in the sports movement, it's a form of social inclusion. Yeah, through these actions, we try to face the exclusion caused by difference in social classes, education, gender, social and racial prejudice. Uh, we share information that normally wouldn't reach them. Uh, we always suggest changes in relation to the institution's day-to-day -day activities. This project uh, aims to creatively and playfully inspire children to live better and to be better uh, through knowledge bringing together health, education, and sports. Um, we believe that sports allow children to develop psychically and psychologically. So we try to give them the opportunity to learn about it and to practice different modalities that they don't have, uh, they wouldn't have access to. Uh, their dream of being athletes or new dreams as professionals in the sport world. In this project, they can get to know and try different sports. Uh, uh, they will learn about the diversity of sports discipline and professions. Uh, in this project, we also carry out a donation campaign action in this community. Uh, we provide the space for donation clothing, food, sport equipment, uh, all that they need for children and for these locations. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, the project had a huge challenge because in addition to the places being closed for people outsiders for safety, uh, one of the project's highlights is the great face-to-face -face personal exchange. The hug, their smiles. Uh, we are talking about children who don't have family and they don't have a uh, bare minimum to live on. So we believe uh, that if you give them attention, if you give them affection, uh, you will show them that you see them. They are important to you. Uh, we believe that they will pay attention and listen to you with an open heart. Uh, we need to make them feel that they are important and part of this community, that they are human beings, they are important to us. Uh, children are an indispensable part of the change, and they need to know that they can make a difference, they can make the world a better place, they can be change makers. And in this period uh, of pandemic, we adapt to the virtual world, as just as we are doing here, uh, we create timeless virtual uh, to the videos 
to teach them Olympic values, Olympic history, sustainability, good habits, uh, being do educational and lively stories. We take the tools and share the videos and knowledge remotely, but without failing to share our love and care in every action. Uh, the next step that we see to this project is have to representatives in some places that I can reach. Videos and donations can reach. Uh, timeless videos can be shared, shared unlimitedly. More shelters, more social centers, and more children can be reached. Over the years, the proposal is to keep the donation campaign so that we can have more people continue visiting and continue having events, getting to know the places, getting to know the children, inspires and includes. Uh, we really believe that donation and social activities have such an impact who those receive and donate. Time, things, we truly believe in that. And now we have an uh, official video that we believe that would be an attraction for potential sponsors. And our goal now is to look for sponsorship for donation of coral hygienic kits, sport equipment, food and sports classes maybe for the children who are living in these places and keep going. Uh, thank you. I try to be short, <laughs> but it's, it's my project. And thank you very much for the attention and the space here to talk. Thank you, Krishna. That was amazing. And, and you, you covered a lot and you gave everybody a really good idea of all the, the work that you're doing. I'm going to now, so thank you for joining us, Krishna. I'm going to now thank pass you. it to my to my colleague Yoko. Um, here she comes. Hi everyone, so my name is Yoko. I'm French based in Barcelona and program manager at New Sports Hub. I would like now to take you to Asia and in particular to South Korea. We are with us today, Aram Kim, who is the education manager at the PyeongChang 2018 uh, Legacy Foundation. And Aram, if you're here, please could you maybe turn on your camera, tell us more about you and what's happening in PyeongChang. So you on mute. <laughs> mute. There you Perfect. Go. Can hear you now. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Aram from the Pyeongchang Legacy Foundation. Um, our foundation was set up after the 2018 Pyeongchang Olympic Games. And we're in charge of creating legacy projects uh, for uh, Pyeongchang 2018. I think we're the probably the newest member of the UNIS family. Um, because we signed the MOU um, with the UNIS Sports Hub in, uh, I think, in February during our third year anniversary of the Games. Um, and for us, we, uh, we first met with uh, Yon and Yoko during the Lausanne uh, 2020 Youth Winter Olympic Games. And we realized that um, the goals of our two organizations really aligned. And now we're working together to create some new uh, social business projects in Korea. Can you tell us more, maybe a bit more about what are the problem we are tackling in Korea and particularly in Pyeongchang? Yeah, um, I think the important thing here uh, is when everybody thinks of Olympic legacy, they think about the unused uh, venues um, and that's always negative news. Uh, the thing that we really connected with the Unisports Hub was that we focused on the people legacy. And we found that there was a big gap, uh, especially in Pyeongchang where there wasn't enough uh, job opportunities for the uh, for youth, and also, you know, um, the younger generation was moving away from Pyeongchang, which is in the countryside, and going moving to the cities. So now we're developing a project together. So we're providing an opportunity for youth to create their own uh, businesses in Pyeongchang to promote tourism, um, which in turn will uh, bring more people into the local co community, uh, increase the spending in the local community, and also at the same time, they can visit the Olympic venues. Thank you for, for sharing with us, Haram, how from uh, like a sports event, sports uh, facilities, we can then create projects that will benefit the whole community. Um, we, we have uh, one athlete, actually you mentioned that this program will help youth to create opportunity for themselves, but the, the, the program will also create opportunity for athletes, right? Yeah, um, I think uh, the, we've already, uh, you know, hit a big milestone where uh, through our collaboration, we've actually created 
um, a social business in Korea uh, for retired athletes. Um, now we have a company called uh, Winter 700. And uh, it's a group of, uh, I think, 15 retired former Korean athletes that uh, didn't have any job prospects. And we uh, brought them together, helped them uh, create a social business. And now they're working with our foundation and also with the Unis Sports Hub in running sports camps for youth in Korea. Um, I think this year we're aiming to have, uh, you know, 10,000 students come to uh, the Olympic venues for three-day camps. Um, it's a great initiative. I think it's fully funded by the government. And I think this is a, uh, you know, a prime example of uh, two great organizations working together to um, find the problem and then find creative solutions. Yeah, so exactly. So Winter 7 and Red is actually one of the first social business we've been created together in Pyeongchang. The founder is uh, YG, YU. I am, I'm probably pronouncing his name in a terrible way, I'm sorry. Uh, unfortunately, he's not with us today, but he shared a video. Uh, just before the shared video, I'll just mention again that this, this, this Winter 700 is a 100% social business. So he will create, the goal of the social business is to propose sport activities in Pyeongchang using the, the facilities of the game, but not only. And uh, the way it would really contribute to the society is one, it will be accessible for everyone, for young people, for old people, for people with disabilities. And second, in his business plan, he ensured that he will hire only athletes to help this community uh, who sometimes do not have access to all training opportunities or education opportunities or work opportunities. Um, so yeah, we hope it's just the beginning and they will, will create many more uh, social businesses up together for the youth and the athletes. And before I let you go, I would, I would share a video that uh, YG shared with us. So image from Pyeongchang of uh, what Winter 700 is doing. To, can you see here? Hear, hear me? Yes. Okay. Well. Uh, okay. So that was a short trip to uh, Korea. Thank you very much, Aram. Is there anything else you would like to say? Um, yeah. I just want to finish off by that. Um, you, we've already done all these great programs, but we're actually in the final stages of submitting a big project to uh, the central government. Um, and hopefully, uh, next time we're here, I can give you guys a better update. But 
Um, social business is uh, it's a new concept in Korea. Um, and the government now is fully uh, on board with creating more social businesses. And I think the UNIS Sports Hub and the UNIS Foundation can play a big role in this. And I just want to thank everybody uh, for being so proactive and so energetic um, and working with us, especially during uh, these COVID pandemic times. So I uh, just want to say thank you, Professor Yunus. Happy birthday. Uh, thank you, Yoko, Yon, and the team. And uh, let's uh, keep rolling. Thank you very much, Aram. And actually, to everyone is there, whenever we we'll be able to travel, I really encourage you to go to Pyeongchang so you can try sport activities with 700 and discover all our other activities. So after this uh, trip in South Korea, Asia, I'd like to bring you to Oceania. But first, uh, let's make a stop in Lausanne again. Um, we have with us Kave Merabi, who is the Athletes Department Director at the International Olympic Committee. Hi, Kave. Thank you very much uh, to be with us. Hello. Hi. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. So maybe I'll let you introduce yourself and then we can talk about uh, the athletes and entrepreneurship. <clears throat> Fantastic. With pleasure. So my name is uh, Kave Mehrabi. Uh, as you said, uh, I, I work at the IUC as the director of the athletes department and of course, have the pleasure to be working together with Professor Yunus and his team on the AT365 Business Accelerator Program. Yeah, yeah. So it's, a, it's it's our pleasure as well. Actually, we have been uh, working on this uh, business accelerator for a few months, years now, supporting athletes. Uh, maybe can you tell us more about uh, this program? Why why is it being created in the first place? Yeah. Um, I, the first of all, I think it's important that uh, in this partnership that we have with uh, uh, Professor Yunus and and uh, and yourself, uh, I, I should note that of course is the program that we also do uh, enjoy the support of the Olympic Solidarity. Why is it why this import, uh, program is important for us? I will break it down to uh, two three key points. First of all, uh, it is very uh, close to our mission to support athletes throughout their career, not only their sporting career, but also their transition to the life after sports or sometimes the dual career while they're competing. So um, this program fits very well within our mission because it helps athletes who are interested to become entrepreneurs and have an impact also within the society while they are also um, <clears throat> Uh, working on the professional side of their their, their career. Um, we also know uh, that athletes, they do have a lot of skills that is very similar to be an entrepreneur. They do many times raise funds for their own uh, sporting career. They do have to take care of the team in terms of the entourage. They have to do take care of communication. They have to organize a lot of logistics. So they have a lot of skills that is very similar and is very comparable with the entrepreneurship. So um, for us, uh, it was a perfect fit, uh, this partnership, because it could then help athletes uh, to become entrepreneurs and, and again, have a social impact. And again, it recognized the important uh, work that uh, we do uh, to support athletes and, and the, the partnership with Professor Yunus and, and um <clears throat> Yunus Sports Hub was the perfect uh, match for this uh, program for us. So thanks for sharing us. Uh, well, of course, we're absolutely in line with you. We believe artists really have the, the potential to become great entrepreneurs, to make their own uh, story, write another story for their own, but also to have social impact all around the world. Um, and talking about this impact around the world, so Business Accelerator is quite a unique program because it's actually for all athletes around the world. So can you maybe share a bit like how this program is implemented in all those countries for all those athletes everywhere? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. So in the first year of the program, we already had a hybrid delivery and that was before the pandemic. But because of the reasons and the, the point that you raised that we wanted the program to be accessible worldwide, we had the, the key, one of the key part of the program was the online course 
that it was uh, developed and delivered for the athletes and Olympians globally. Um, so this course was available to all athletes across the world, and then they could benefit from it. And if they were interested to go further, then they could submit their projects to be selected for the workshops and eventually the mentorship, which was the third phase. So uh, we had already um, considered that possibility to make sure that the, the resources and the content is available to athletes globally through that online uh, learning course. Then uh, due to COVID, of course, uh, most of the program and projects across different uh, uh, part of the, the world and different businesses had to move to a digital delivery anyway. So with that also, the business accelerator also has been uh, pivoted to the online uh, delivery. Um, <clears throat> we have had boot camps for the, for the second year where, the, where athletes could uh, get more familiar with the program through those online boot camps uh, at the regional level. Uh, which has been also delivered in three languages. Uh, and then from there, uh, we have been then continuing with the online learning. And then, of course, eventually with the final successful Olympians who will be able to uh, benefit from a six months personalized mentoring program. Thanks for sharing. Uh, yeah, I think that that's a great uh, power of the IOC in being able to offer this, uh, this program to the like biggest number of artists around the world. You mentioned the online, the digital aspect of the program, but also the language as aspect, like the online course, I think is in more than seven languages. And then the mentoring of at least will, the Olympian will be selected, will be in their own language. So uh, yeah, that, that will definitely exactly. be a great program for the athletes. Uh, Today, uh, we don't have an artist that will be joining us, but we have she, um, Michael Z, was an athlete who participated in the first promotion of Business Accelerator. He's from New Zealand, uh, in Oceania, and is currently in lockdown in Australia, actually, where he was training for, with his team because he's going to Tokyo, but he did find the time to share a video with us. Hi everyone, Shay McAleese here. I'm a current New Zealand men's black sticks hockey player. Um, I'm also a three-time Olympian and hopefully going to the Tokyo Olympic Games uh, coming up shortly. Um, unfortunately, we're currently here in Australia. Uh, we had a couple of games. I managed to get a few stitches on my chin. <laughs> not ideal. Um, but even more uh, not ideal is the fact that we're actually stuck in lockdown. So I'm currently interviewing myself in my own room uh, to get this video done for you. Um, I want to share a little bit about my uh, sport experience. Um, so I've been playing hockey now for around 17 years uh, for the national team um, and loved every minute of it, which has been really cool for me. Um, and from that, I've been able to grow um, my own uh, business called Inside Hockey. Um, and I actually play with my own hockey sticks now. Um, got a couple of international players playing with the brand as well, which has been really cool. Uh, but originally started as a social media company, um, sending videos and, and things to, to the global audience. Uh, we've got a really big following of around 120,000 followers on Facebook and Instagram, which is re really cool. And that's sort of grown the ability to do my own thing. Um, so how this actually works is that um, de it designed our own hockey stick, as you can see. Um, every hockey stick that is purchased. We also uh, plant a native tree. Um, so that's a really good way to give back to the environment through um, uh, purchasing a hockey stick. And also every hockey stick that is purchased, we also give away a free hockey stick into the community. So that can be to um, people that maybe not get the chance to play hockey, um, that might have seen it a bridge too far, potentially through expense or just uh, the chance to actually um, partake in the sport. And that's a really great way for us to, one, as a company to give back to the community through um, our Give a Stick um, campaign and the other one um, through our Plant a Tree campaign to, to support the environment. So it's something we're really passionate about and looking forward to carry on growing um, what we actually do. Um, a little bit about the the sort of entrepreneurial journey that I had with Business Accelerator. So originally when I started the um, my journey with um, Athlete365, um, uh, 
was kind of thinking about a more of a digital platform around how to gain more traction from our social media company. And then from that, um, this hockey stick company um, brand sort of grew into its own. Um, it was probably the easiest and best way to follow my passion, which was to uh, to give back to the environment and give back to the community. Um, I think there's been a large push in that space from a lot of companies these days. Um, and that's something that I know I'm really passionate about as well. Um, as we stand now, um, probably had about $30,000 in sales, which has been really cool for us. Um, we haven't been going for very long, um, but that's been a real big um, big push for us. We've actually been able to work with a few other companies as well. So one company is uh, Big Safe Furniture. Um, and because we have all the graphical um, design of everything we do, we've got Inside Hockey on the back, and then we put Big Safe Furniture on the front. Um, and what they've done is they're gonna, they've ordered 500 uh, wooden sticks and they're gonna give those out into the community for free. Um, so it's great branding and marketing for us, but also for them. Um, and then we're actually looking further down the line around how to design our own hockey stick with them. Um, and that would be a wool-based hockey stick, which should be pretty cool um, to see if we can actually get that done. Um, to me, the the whole journey has been has been one hell of an experience. Um, something that I'd I'd never um, give up for anything. Um, I've really enjoyed it. I've really enjoyed getting my feet um, on the ground into something, get stuck into something. Um, and I think it's always great to to do what you love, do what you know, and um, something that you're always really really passionate about. Um, so thank you for your time. Um, I hope my uh, few words here might be insightful for some. Um, more than happy for you to reach out to me and, and ask me a few more questions around my journey and how I got to where I have, because um, there's been many hours uh, spent getting to where I have. It's not always um, rosy, not always simple. There are a few road bumps along the way, um, but I guarantee if, you, if it's something you're passionate about, you're always going to carry on driving forward. So from me and Inside Hockey, um, Hear from you soon. Cheers. Bye. Okay, and we're back. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm a really a big fan of, of she and Inside Okay, not only because he's is a super cool human being, but I think his stories can really inspire other athletes to launch that project and also uh, support the community and the environment. Kave, did you want to say let's world? Yes, not just a big thank you. To, to yourself and everyone involved. Uh, it's great to hear the, the experience of she uh, firsthand and we can see it through this partnership that we can hopefully make a real difference for the life of Olympians and, and, and through them uh, make an impact in our society and the community. So that was just a perfect example and, and uh, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't add anything to that. I think uh, he said it perfectly. Quickly. So um, thank you again for the partnership and then this opportunity to discuss this uh, together. Thank you very much for being with us and for all the, the stories we're writing together. And uh, I guess we'll speak very time, uh, anytime soon. Okay, so after Oceania, I propose to go back to Europe, uh, more precisely in Paris, where the UNO Sports Hub has been collaborating with Lecano and Paris 2024, so we're in France, and we have been working on how we could organize the most inclusive and sustainable game of the history. Uh, so Christophe Divi was the director of ESS 2024, one platform that uh, I will tell uh, someone will tell you more about it in time soon, uh, could not be with us today, but he did record the video and he will tell you more about how this platform works and what are the first results. So let me share my screen again. Good morning, everybody. I'm very pleased uh, to be with you. Thank you very much for the invitation. I wish I was with you uh, physically, I would say, but uh, um, I hope it will be possible the next time. Um, I'm uh, Christophe Divi. I'm the director of the platform ESS 2024. ESS for uh, Economy, Social et Solidaire in French, uh, Social uh, Business Economy in English. Um, so the platform ESS 2024 um, is a platform that has been launched uh, since uh, 2018, two years ago, two years and a half ago. And um, it's uh, a key tool 
role in the art of the strategy, of the policy, of the legacy policy of uh, the Organization Committee uh, Paris 2024. Uh, the aim of the platform ESS 2024 is to help, is to accompany, is to create the conditions for local social businesses here in France, in all the territories in France, in Paris of course, but uh, all over the, the country, uh, to uh, create the conditions for these companies to be the, to all the procurements of the game, uh, all the procurements to prepare, to organize, and then to dissolve the games, the Olympic Games and the Paralympic Games in 2024. So uh, uh, we are working daily on more than um, uh, hundreds and, uh, and uh, thousands of uh, procurements in all the economic activity sectors, because we think that uh, all the social businesses, if they are uh, really well informed of uh, the economic opportunities, if they are really well accompanied uh, to cooperate with the bigger companies, with the big operators, uh, then they can uh, convince by 2024 that their innovations, their social, environmental innovations can be applied uh, in Paris 2024 uh, for uh, this big event uh, that is uh, the organization of the, of the games. And dynamic is on now, the dynamic is positive. Uh, we have uh, uh, first results since, uh, since uh, two years and a half ago uh, because uh, on the first uh, procurements, more than 160, 161 to be uh, precise, uh, social business, local French uh, companies uh, have uh, won uh, um, some uh, some uh, procurements in, uh, for example, the catering sector. Uh, we have more than 20 uh, local uh, companies that are going to work with the big catering operator for what will be in 2024 um, the the catering place for all the athletes all over the world. So it's a very good reference, it's a very good experience, and I think it's a good example, uh, this uh, catering procurement, that we are going to now uh, accelerate the, the, the dynamic. We are really uh, uh, modest. I want to I want to insist on the, on the, on the fact that we have still three more years to, to work on, on this project. So the first results are positive and interesting, uh, but we are really modest on the next step, and we are going going to, to continue this dynamic and, and I want to thank the, the Professor Yunus because he was himself uh, at the origin of the project of the platform ESS 2024 uh, in uh, in 2018, and uh, he's always uh, challenging us. He is he's really convinced of the of the power of sport, uh, of the power of uh, sport events uh, to uh, to uh, make the economic development of these small and social businesses uh, possible. Um, so we are looking forward uh, as soon as it's uh, possible again uh, to welcome in. In, in, in Paris because uh, he, he came a couple of uh, times uh, this uh, last month and, and uh, we want to present him uh, these results, we want to, to uh, visit uh, all the future infrastructures of Paris 2024 with him and I want to thank him, I want to thank his team uh, of the UNO Sports Hub. Uh, we are going to continue the work, uh, the good work we are making together. Uh, we are looking forward also uh, of being in inspired by all the the international experiences you have. So I am very glad of this uh, collaboration and I'm looking forward to, uh, to come again, uh, maybe next time, and, and to, uh, to uh, update uh, all the good results we have, all the good first results we have with uh, this uh, platform ESS 2024. Okay, so here was uh, the initiative, uh, like an in, in innovative initiative in Paris on how a sport event can contribute to the development of the social economy while using the procurement of the event. Uh, so if you want to know about, more about it, like Christophe is not there, but you can check the website ess2024.org and you will have uh, many more information on how this platform works, how they manage to create this ecosystem to boost the social economy uh, in France. That was it for uh, Paris. Now I just have a question. Is Florence here by any chance? Florence is here. Hello, hello. Yes, I hello, am. Hello, hello. Uh, so, so nice to see you. So I will leave uh, the stage to Maris. I will uh, do the introduction. Thank you. But thank you all. <laughs>
Oh, I just got a huge smile on my face. Sorry, I didn't see your name. And so I was a little bit worried, but I knew that you would show up. So thank you um, for joining. <laughs> this is Florence Darkie Bossard. Apologies if I'm saying this incorrectly, but I'm trying. Um, she's the Global Marketing Director at Danone. And we are really excited to have her here today. Um, Danone is a longtime partner in the Eunice ecosystem with Grameen Danone and Danone Community Fund as key examples. And what's really um, interesting and related to sport is that since 2019, Professor Eunice has been an ambassador of the Danone Nations Cup. Um, for those of you who do not know what this is, it's the world's biggest football tournament for children aged 10 to 12 years old. So we are really excited um, that Florence is here today. And I'd like to first, I've got two questions for you, Florence. And, and the first would be, um, yeah, what is, what's the significance of having Professor Yunus as the ambassador, as one of the ambassadors, I understand, I think there's three of the Danone uh, Nations Cup. So first of all, uh, you said it, Professor Yunus uh, has been uh, a friend of Danone and um, has been helping us to uh, make sure that uh, the mission of Danone was uh, uh, bringing to life uh, because uh, our mission is to bring health uh, through food to as many people as possible. And uh, when we say that uh, comes the notion of health, planet, but also inclusion of people. And Professor Yunus has been uh, very instrumental in driving uh, the change at Danone, uh, at Danone level. When it comes to Danon Nations Cup, it's another story because Danon Nations Cup, as you said, is a, a 20 years football competition gathering uh, 2 million kids uh, worldwide, girls and boys, uh, around football. And uh, we shared something together with Professor Yunus is that uh, sport is a massive uh, weapon to accelerate and uh, to change uh, people for the better. And we believe that kids are the one uh, that have uh, this uh, flame in the eyes, this sparkle uh, to see uh, how everything can be possible. And at the Nations Cup, combining the power and the passion of football with uh, the passion and the power of kids, we believe that sport can really be a force for good. Having said that comes the how do we do that? And uh, because of the pandemic, we had to pivot a bit the model. We, we cannot run competition anymore uh, uh, in uh, countries. So then a Nations Cup is operated across 25 countries in normal time. In times of pandemic, it's zero. So we needed to pivot the model. And so we are very happy uh, to bring to life our commitment to join forces uh, with sport and kids to have a greater impact. And we propose a new kind of competition that would be combining physical exercising with uh, uh, e-sport and gaming. And the idea here is not to uh, bring kids uh, closer to screens or being more glued to screens, not at all. Uh, the objective is to speak the same language as they do. They are native digital. They are fluent in digital. And uh, in order for them to better understand uh, what are uh, the stakes at world level, uh, we believe that we can have uh, uh, and we can leverage these um, digital tools. So in a nutshell, what we do is that we create a new kind of competition online. We have famous ambassadors like Professor Yunus, but also in the field of uh, football, like uh, Raphael Varane, a uh, famous defender in football, a French team, but also uh, playing in uh, Madrid. <laughs> uh, we have uh, Adai Gerberg as well. Uh, and uh, those three ambassadors will uh, uh, ask children to take up challenges, physical challenges, but also uh, uh, mental challenges uh, answering quiz, exercising, and at the same time winning points. And those points are not uh, uh, traditional points, they are impact points. So the more they are uh, earning points, the more they would be able to impact actions of uh, NGOs and social business um, to which Danone will be happy to support, to complement, uh, so that the uh, impact and the actions can be long lasting and even more impactful. 
So the commitment we take together with uh, Yunus Sports Hub and Professor Yunus is to uh, make sure that we have uh, NGOs operating with football and kids, and uh, we want to transform them and we want to invite them to uh, uh, become a social business. So this is the raise your voice challenge that um, we propose, uh, calling for applications, uh, helping uh, NGOs to uh, have another perspective, uh, making sure that they can have a long lasting impact and having kids and ambassadors and Danone supporting them uh, on the years to implement their pivot. So this is in a nutshell what is uh, on the plate. It will be live on the 8th of July. And uh, for us, it's important to have Professor Yunus and uh, the competencies and the expertise of the Yunus Sports Hub to make sure that what we are doing in terms of action is tangible, is uh, impacting, and is really um, embedded into sport and kids. Thank you, Lawrence. You actually answered the second question I was going to ask about Raise Your Voice Challenge. And we are ex super excited to be part of this, to launch it, as you said, on July 8th. And we will get our community, um, our networks, and everybody uh, backing it and, and amplifying it and making sure that lots of people know about this opportunity. So, so thank you for, for that and, and for sharing a lot about the partnerships. Um, and yeah, we are actually going to, because we're Getting close to the, our, our time limit here. We are going to end. Um, I'm going to say thank you to Florence again for joining. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Abby Smith, who normally is in the States, in the US, but now she's joining us here in France. Um, and she's our community manager, and she will tell you a little bit more about our community. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, you may have seen me in the past on some of the events that we do for our sport and social business community. Um, if not, I'm Abby, I'm the community manager. A little bit more about our community. Um, the sport and social business community gathers problem solvers around the world and, and helps empower them through uh, sport and social business uh, to make change in their communities locally and collectively across the globe. Um, this is what you may have seen. We recently formally launched this community together. Um, at the beginning of the year and with a big kickoff party from Professor Yunus. So now we get to celebrate him again on his birthday. Um, and we've built it in a way that really empowers young people to make meaningful change in their communities. Uh, together in this community, we all work together to learn more about sport and social business, um, to take action locally and across the globe. And to um, empower other problem solvers in that in their journeys. So what that kind of looked like, you, you saw it a little bit in, in our launch series. We have a combination of different virtual um, ways of building an offline community, working through our regional leaders, which I think I see some of them are on here today. I know Panis is here um, from Europe. And then that also goes into some of the events that we run and the content that we produce. So I'm really excited to reveal what we have coming up next for the community. This is something that has been much anticipated. Um, and thank you to our friends at IAC who will we'll hear from Vincent later about more behind this, but we will be launching the sport and environment mobilization of the sport and social business community. Um, so what this is, is it will be a combination of different events and content and ways for us to learn about how to use sport and social business to tackle environmental challenges, uh, featuring some events from our friends at Unisports Hub, as well as experts uh, in the Unisports Hub team as well. So to tell you a little bit more about that, we will hop over to Vincent in just a minute, but my, my colleague Sophia here is going to share some key dates and information. Sophia is our communications manager at Unisports Hub. Hi everyone, good to see you. So we have a really robust schedule for the next um, series coming up. Together we'll get to learn from the best in sport, social business and the environment. So starting us off on July 29th is the Raise Your Game session with Clément where we will learn tips and tricks on pitching the Raise Your Game series are um, sessions with experts from Unisports Hub. Uh, next up on August 20th, we have an expert sessions with our friends from Unis Environmental Hub, 
where we will learn how to use social business to tackle the environmental crisis. And we will finally conclude the sport and environment pitching competition um, in mid-September. And Vincent will talk a little bit more about that in a second. The details and application info will be sent um, via email. So make sure you join our community to stay in the loop. Yeah, so a little bit about that competition before I pass it over to Vincent. It's going to be super cool. So everyone in our community will have, uh, we'll send out the details in the email, like we said, but you'll have a chance to pitch your solution for uh, to win a prize of a thousand euros. So that's going to be super cool. And we've really built this mobilization in a way to empower you in your pitch. So without further ado, let's hop over to hear from Vincent. Um, Vincent Defrant is a French athlete who was an Olympic champion in biathlon in 2006 and flag bearer for the French team in 2010. After his sports career, Vincent has been working for the Youth Olympic Games, and he also directed a corporate foundation dedicated to social causes and created in 2013 a crowdfunding platform to help people suffering from indecent housing. Um, in 2020, Vincent founded IAC, a technical sportswear brand eco-responsible and committed to offer more ecology and respect for nature in mountain sports activities. So to get to know Vincent a little bit better, Soph and I have prepared a few questions. Vincent, are you here? You're here. All yeah, right. I'm here. Hello. Hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm very, All right, good, so very first, good. Thank you for the invitation. Happy to have you here. So my first question, um, after a very successful athletic and Olympic career, you tackled a new challenge with the creation of IAC in 2020 to give new practitioners and new generations of skiers and hikers the opportunity to discover the mountain without harming the environment. Could you tell us a little bit more about IAC and your entrepreneurial journey? Yeah, yeah, pleasure to, to do so. Um, so once again, thank you for having me. And Sim IAC is a simple project. Uh, we want to, like you said, to bring more um, respect for the nature, more respect of the environment in the world of the outdoor industry, in the world of the outdoor and the sports and in the mountain sports, uh, especially. And uh, so this is a company which has two uh, pillars that we want to activate as from the beginning. Uh, the company uh, products. So we built uh, garments and we want to develop uh, eco-designed uh, products in order that the garments that are used by the sportsmen and sportswomen in the mountains are minimizing the impact of these, gar of these, uh, of these garments. And um, so we eco-design products. And the second way we want to act for environment is uh, to have uh, an environmental commitment as from the beginning of the brand. And uh, we do that by dedicating uh, a significant part of our uh, finances. We are small, we are very humble, but we will grow. And uh, we want to de dedicate significant part of our finances of the company to support some concrete actions on the ground in favor of the environment. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Vincent. We're so excited to be working with you on this mobilization. I think that our community members have a lot to learn um, from you and from IAC. So I think we're a little tight on time. So one, one other question for you. IAC does not tackle environmental challenges alone, but empowers social businesses in their problem solving journey to collaboratively build a better world. What was your motivation in supporting other social businesses through this pitching competition? Huh. Um... Um, the idea of uh, supporting social businesses with the actions that we want to, 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 to support is, uh, is coming from my past of the last years, because after my sport career and during my sport career, during uh, 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 almost 20 years, I crossed the activities of uh, NGOs, of associations, of businesses, of uh, organizations, of events, and of social business. And Thanks to all these um, uh, meets, I, I, I developed the deep conviction that uh, businesses and mainly social businesses are the, are the strongest hands that we have to act for the social causes that we want to fight, the, for the, that we want to defend, 
for the environmental uh, challenges that the world is facing. So I developed the deep conviction that social business is the most powerful tool in the world for a better world. And that's why uh, we want to have a company that is engaged to strongly and sustainably support some social businesses. And um, this is this is this comes from from the last meets, and also it comes from uh, our common friend Johan. He said he brought a lot of people with social business, and he did a lot with me, convincing me that uh, it's a very very strong thing that we that we can support. Great. I'm just seeing a message um, about from Shazib. Uh, this this thank you, Vincent. That was our final question, and we're. So excited um, for this mobilization. So to get the details of that, you just have to join the Sport and Social Business community on the website and we'll be sending out an email. Um, and now I'm seeing from, I'll say a big thank you from our full team at Unisports Hub to all of these incredible experts that we've heard from today. I know personally, I have learned so much from hopping around the world and I'm sure everyone else has as well. Um, and it was pretty fun too. So uh, belated, very special and happy birthday to Professor Eunice. And remember everyone, whatever you do, do, do it, it with joy. joy. And now I think we'll pass it over to Shazib. Hi, thank you so much. Um... Now I'd like to request Professor Yunus to make, Hi, Professor Yunus. make a comment. Hi there, hi there. I'm listening to everything you're saying, just uh, not to disrupt you, I'm hiding. I'm just <laughs> a fly on the wall, watching everybody, talking everything. So it's a fantastic session. I enjoyed every moment of it. I felt so excited. Uh, you're talking and uh, taking us to different places in Pyeongchang and uh, Ivory Coast and all the places, uh, seeing where their things are happening. So I totally enjoyed it and got very excited. Uh, talking about sports and social business and theoretical way is one thing. Seeing things, it's happening. And uh, people are behind it and excited about it. Uh, that's something else. It touches you. It uh, energizes you. And you have done that. Uh, the way you have uh, been talking, the way you have presented it. Uh, as you said, it's a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun. I, I had lots of fun, that's for sure. And uh, thanks to all of you, the team and all the people on the ground who are doing this. It's an idea, simple idea, but never tried. Uh, I was keep on, I was, I keep mentioning about it, that uh, sports is a big power and we have, a, we have a good use for uh, social purposes. And that's where the beginning of it. And then uh, you brought the Danone experience and you brought all the Olympic experience and the uh, Paris ESS uh, 2024, all the kind of things. And now everybody's high, uh, peeping through this one window here. <laughs> I, see, <laughs> I see everybody, Yuan, Yoko, and everybody here. All right, yeah. good to see you. Now I'm just thanking all, all, the, all the people that are behind it. And I say it's a real, it's not anymore just a talk, talk, talk. Uh, you are connected with the people on the ground. Not only are connected at the top of the IOC and the Olympic and the, everything that you do, but you're really connected with people who are sports and they got the message. That's a wonderful thing that the way, when they talk about it, uh, this I see that they really got the message. You could communicate and that's what your success is. And I wish you thank you for doing this excellent work and, we'll, and thank you for presenting it for all of us. I'm sure many other people who have been watching it and enjoying it as I did. And Lamia wants to say something, I guess. He's, she is here. No, so I'm Lamia. Watching, I also congratulate from us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very good. Nice to see the whole YSH team in one screen there. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Take a picture. Take a picture with them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why, why? Why, why? There. <laughs> All right. There you go. All right. Done it. Thank you. Thank you. So do the excellent work. We, we can replay it. You can watch it again. Uh, such a wonderful thing that you have done. Okay, we'll say good night from here and it's a good day for you. And uh, thank you for this excellent presentation. Bye-bye. Thank you, thank you for thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. And I, 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 I was there all along. I never missed <laughs> a minute. Of you it, went so. all the way around the world today. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, I did do that. Thank uh -huh. you, bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.
Thank you so much, Yunus Sports Up Team. Thank you so much, Professor Yunus, and thank you so much, Lamia Morshed. Now it's time for another exciting plenary session, Building a Circular Economy, WestWise Partnership Global Launch, organized by the Yunus Environment Hub. WestWise Partnership is an initiative um, spearheaded by UN Habitat under the WestWise Cities Program and was founded with the vision of contributing to the achievement of healthier ecosystems and communities by improving municipal solid waste management in cities and supporting them in transition from the current linear to a more circular economy. To moderate this session, may I please welcome Francesca Calisesi, Associate Officer, Solid Waste Management and Energy, UN Habitat. Over to you. Hello, thank you very much, uh, uh, Shanzib, for the introduction and <clears throat> welcome everyone to the global launch of the WasteWise partnership. Um, as uh, Shanzib introduced, uh, this uh, is a, an uh, initiative uh, led by uh, UN Habitat, but is being uh, launched together with our partners, um, Afal Norge, um, UNOS Environmental Hub and the International Solid Waste Association, or ISOM. Um, I'm sorry we are starting a bit late, uh, but anyway, I take the opportunity to welcome again everyone and thank you for, for attending this session. Uh, our agenda, we are going to start with opening remarks by uh, Professor Yunus. And then we are going to have uh, some remarks also from our executive director, uh, Maimuna uh, Mot Sharif. And then we're going to have interventions from the um, founding members of the WasteWise Partnership, and also some other interventions from uh, 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 other partners that uh, are already uh, willing to join the partnership, and then uh, other interventions from uh, our uh, partners, GIZ and Waste Aware. Then we're gonna have some Q&A session and finally uh, the closing remarks. So I'm gonna now hand it over to Professor uh, Yunus uh, to deliver the opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, just welcome you to the Social Business Day. It's a fantastic occasion so that we can all get together and see what we have been doing in this <clears throat> past year. And we do it every year. <clears throat> <As again. coughs> dried up. Uh, so we do it every year, uh, get together uh, and um, have ex exchange of uh, information to each other, pass on all the excitement from each other. So this is what we're doing now. And uh, you know, this Environment Hub is a very, very important organization for us because when we talk about three zeros, that, come, that zero comes first, uh, zero net carbon emission. That's environment. And that's what we're looking forward to. Now we are also going into um, uh, three zero clubs that uh, we have announced that we invite all the young people to create five member three zero clubs. And again, uh, you have to do a lot of of explaining to the young people why is it so important because they have to be on the driver's seat uh, instead of waiting for the governments to solve the problem, businesses to solve the problem. Now the young people will be in the driver's seat, they will be on the uh, cockpit and fly this plane and make sure that it's a safe, safe world and this is a very important thing. So the communication wise, uh, you have a lot of work to do uh, as we go along so, to the young generation so that they take the uh, lead. They take take over the uh, responsibility of making this world as a safe place. And I'm wa waiting for the, all the presentations that you have listed and wish you all the luck and uh, have a great uh, session. Thank you very much. Welcome to the Social Business Day. Thank you so much and congratulations for like uh, today we are celebrating the 11th uh, uh, Social Business Day. So that's it's definitely a great achieve achievement and it's a great honor for, for us to, to have you here and that you give us the opportunity to host this event uh, during the Social Business Day. Thank you again. Thank you. 
And now um, we are gonna have also, as I mentioned, some remarks from our executive, the UN Habitat Executive Director. So if please, uh, uh, Shazib could facilitate. Thank you. Professor Mohammed Yunus, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to all of you. I'm glad to be invited and hosted by Nobel Laureate Professor Mohammed Yunus on the observance of the 11th Social Business Day to launch the Waste Wise Partnership. Mohammed Yunus' personal leadership on the issue of ending poverty through the power of business is exemplary and inspiring. I would like to acknowledge the impressive achievement of the UNUS social business initiated in 1983 with the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh, which spearheaded a microfinance revolution for which Professor Yunus won the Nobel Peace Prize. It is remarkable to see how a business model with a social mission at its core lift people out of poverty. The current pandemic reminds us how significant such an initiative has been. The theme of this year's Social Business Day of No Going Back is so relevant today with the world facing the climate and health crisis. The COVID-19 pandemic highlighted the inequalities in the world's cities, especially the inadequacy in providing basic services such as water supply, transport, and waste management. Nevertheless, COVID-19 has also pointed to opportunities. We must exploit them to build back better and greener. I am very happy to hear about the upcoming launch by UNOS Social Business of the Three Zero Club, an initiative towards achieving the vision, a world of three zeros, zero net carbon emission, zero wealth concentration, and zero unemployment. This initiative is fully aligned with the new urban agenda and UN Habitat's work, including the Waste Wise Cities Program, a call for action to local governments to tackle the global waste crisis. We look forward to working with the Three Zero Club in implementing our strategic plan with the objective of leaving no one and no place behind. I'm honored to inform that the Waste Wise Partnership, spearheaded by UN Habitat, has among its founding members the UNOS Environment Hub, the FRAL Notch Organization, and the International Solid Waste Association. By joining forces, utilizing innovative and people oriented approaches such as social business, we will recover from this pandemic and make progress towards the SDGs and the targets set out in the new urban agenda and the Paris agreements. Thank you. Thank you to our executive uh, director. Now I would like to end it over uh, to Carlos Silva Filo, the president of the International Solid Waste Association. Carlos, you are welcome. Thank you, Francesca. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to all. Hello, Professor Yunus. It's a great pleasure to be here today and thank you for hosting us at the Social Business Day event. For us, it's a great honor to be together for this launch of a new partnership directed to solve one of the biggest humanity problems, which is uh, delivering sound waste management throughout the world. And here on behalf of ISWA, the International Solid Waste Association, I'm proud to be uh, together with the United Nations Human Settlements Program, UN Habitat, the UNUS Environment Hub, and Aval Nord, uh, one of the founding partners of this waste, this new waste wise partnership. 
and uh, ISVA has been founded 51 years ago. And it started its activities after the merge of two existing associations at that time. So since the beginning, cooperation and globalization are part of our uh, DNA. And today with this new initiative, we are reinforcing the aspects of our DNA. Uh, and here lies the most important opportunity for the future. Bring all lessons learned by ISVA during this half a century of existence together with the lessons learned from our different partners and make it happen. The land has, has never been so fertile to, to, our, co to our cause. And uh, Isla's vision uh, is the one in which waste should be reused and reduced to a minimum and then collected, recycled, and treated properly. So residual matter should be disposed of in a safely engineered way, ensuring a clean and healthy environment to all. The WasteWise partnership in which we are proud, as I mentioned, to be one of the found, founding partners and active supporters aims to enhance municipal solid waste best practices and the transition to a circular economy. And this is the decade of action. We have until 2030 to achieve several improvements and the goals set by the Sustainable Development Goals, a global agenda to beat poverty, to protect the environment and build a prosperous world, leaving no one behind. Uh, unmanaged waste, unfortunately, is one of the largest sources of pollution, ecosystem degradation, and health problems nowadays, posing a big threat to our society. But it doesn't need to be that way. The waste industry can be a net saver of greenhouse gases emissions, can be a central pillar of circular economy, a resource and energy provider. Uh, waste can be uh, a transformed into renewable energy, used as secondary material and being an environmental and economic asset. So here we are to take the first step to implement this important initiative the waste-wise partnership based on joint cooperation to implement practical and concrete changes with impacts on the ground, to develop sustainable and professional waste management locally, to restore urban ecosystems by engaging local authorities, decision makers, decision makers, uh, businesses, entrepreneurs, the academia, and citizens. We need to integrate ideas to replicate successful cases and support the political will to make changes and improvements at the local level. Because after all, the right to enjoy an environment with clean and uh, uh, healthy air, seas, and soils is a basic human right to be valued and enjoyed by all. So thank you very much for this opportunity and looking forward for this joint cooperation towards the improvement of and delivering sound waste management worldwide. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Carlos, for your inspiring words. I, I very much agree with what you say. And also like uh, we have also one goal, one of the SDG goals is about partnership, the 17 partnership for, for the goals. So thank you. And now uh, I'm gonna end it over to uh, Cecile Lid, who is the coordinator of the CLOCK uh, project. Cecile, uh, you're welcome. Thank you very much. I'll try to share my screen with you. Um, just one moment. Here we are. And if I go here, I think we have it in full screen, do we? You can see it now? Is yes. It's visible, thank you. Just one moment. So uh, my name is Cecilia Lind and I am the CEO of Afa Norge. I'm going to talk to you about Afa Norge and the Clean Ocean Through Clean, Clean Communities program, which is uh, co-founding the Waste Wise program. First, a little bit about us. We represent the waste and recycling industry in Norway. We have about 200 member organizations from both the public and the private sector. And we are leveraging 30 years of industry specific knowledge to promote and develop socially responsible and environmentally sound waste management, waste management practices and policies. Our contribution, we have a long experience um, with Norwegian waste management and we are, of course, eager to contribute internationally. The waste management sector in Norway has undergone a huge transition from a situation in the 70s, where the majority of the waste went to landfills, and until today, where only 4% of the waste ends up in landfills. And we have an increasing focus on material recovery and a circular economy. And we believe that it's our social responsibility as a waste management actor to contribute to knowledge and experience internationally. So cleaning up uh, the clock program, have, we have been engaged in that since, uh, nine, since 2018. Uh, and clock is grounded in the belief that to clean up our oceans, we must start with what we do on the land. For us, this means to improve waste management in countries where large quantities of waste ends up in the oceans through rivers and waterways. And we are currently focusing on Indonesia. As I said, CLOCK was started by Afal Norge in 2018 with ISVA as its main partner. The main uh, source of funding is NORAD, uh, the Norwegian Development Agency. And we are part of the Norwegian government's initiative to reduce marine plastic pollution and microplastics, both nationally and internationally. Our vision is to achieve sustainable societies, healthy oceans, and a clean environment through inclusive and sustainable waste management, through responsible use of resources, and by creating jobs and business opportunities in circular value chains. Cooperation and partnering with other organizations is at the core of our, our, our strategic approach in the CLOCK program. And Afal Norge, through CLOCK, is proud to be partner of the Waste Wise Partnership. And we look forward to combine forces to enhance the municipal solid waste management and the transition to a circular economy. We are co founding. Wise, wise partnerships together with UN Habitat and the UNUS Environmental Hub. ISVA is our main partner in Indonesia. Uh, it's our main partner in the project, but as uh, in Indonesia, INSVA, the Indonesian Solid Waste Association, and Re Rethinking Recycling Academy and Systemic is partners. And by that, I will give the word over to Aditi Ramola, who is the technical director of ISVA, who will talk more about the clock approach 
and involvement in Banuangi in Indonesia. So Aditi, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Cecilia. Um, so I just briefly want to mention what we're doing in this project. So we're using the integrated sustainable waste management approach, which addresses common challenges and emphasizes three important dimensions, stakeholders, waste system elements, and sustainability. And within this framework, we're using a participatory planning process through hybrid training setups, conducting stakeholder meetings, conducting baseline assessments, uh, and also waste master plan development with a focus on governance and stakeholder involvement. So uh, just to tell you briefly, the project itself is divided into three work packages. And work package one is to do with training of local government officials for development of waste master plans and waste management plans. Work package two is the development and implementation uh, of the plans itself, uh, also uh, allowing for a digital network for participants to be able to interact with experts and other trainers and mentors. Work package three, uh, which is our final work package, uh, consists of a support program for waste, uh, for improved waste value chains and solutions uh, on the ground. Next slide, please. So um, in terms of resources, uh, as Cecilia mentioned, to reduce marine plastic pollution, our approach is to build capacity and skills in waste and resource management. And we do this through a roster of international and local trainers and experts who are actually available for in-person and digital training and mentoring uh, with the participants. And we work with the same participants uh, over a few months to start developing waste master plans very specific to the context in which they're living and working in. Next slide, please. And just finally, uh, so we have begun working in Banyuwangi in Indonesia, and we've uh, begun with carrying out baseline assessment using the UN Habitat uh, Waste by Cities tool, which was launched this past uh, February. And we've carried out trainings and stakeholder meetings as well as part of the seven step planning process. Uh, a key challenge that we're seeing here is uh, getting all the stakeholders and actors together to be on the same page. For instance, the discussion and the balance between a top down and a bottom up approach uh, we follow a hybrid approach in this case as well, and always a participatory uh, planning process. Uh, there are also issues about access to funding that matches the actual local planning needs, uh, et cetera, but I won't go much into it right now. More information about our project can be found on our website, which is clockglobal.org. Uh, we are open for collaborations and partnerships, so definitely reach out and uh, ask us more. Uh, thank you very much, Francesca. The floor is yours. Thank you both to you, Aditi and Cecily. And um, actually, um, thanks for mentioning about uh, the use of the Wasteway Cities tool. Actually, um, the um, one of the goals uh, and uh, uh, and aims of the Wastewise Partnership is to uh, standardize the methodologies. Uh, uh, for, for example, uh, waste uh, uh, solid municipal solid waste uh, assessment. So thank you. And now I'll end it over to Christina. You're welcome from UNUS Environment Hub. Thank you very much, Francesca. And um, happy Social Business Day to, to everyone. Um, it's really a great pleasure to um, announce the Vice Vice Partnership today. I think it has been uh, roughly exactly one year when we started uh, the conversations working together with Francesca from UN Habitat, Apal Norsche. And, and ISWA to prepare this partnership. And it makes me extremely happy to have the occasion of Social Business Day for, for announcing this, this amazing partnership. Building a circular economy um, needs a systemic effort that requires multi-stakeholder partnerships between the private, the public sector, and the civil society sector. And that's why we are so excited and, and our motivation for joining this partnership, because it really brings partners together to enhance coordination and cooperation among relevant organizations, and then to deliver aligned products and methodologies um, to support cities and countries in establishing a circular economy. And also, um, we are very um, excited that the founding members, and in particular UN Habitat, uh, really recognizes the importance of social business entrepreneurship and for empowering citizens to develop solutions in their communities. And um, we believe that the partnership brings a complementary set of, of expertise, experiences, backgrounds, networks together um, that will help advance the circular economy in many cities around the world. 
Um, for the ones who, who don't know UNOS Environment Hub, um, we are a global organization uh, developing and supporting social business solutions for achieving a circular economy. We offer incubation and acceleration programs for existing social business entrepreneurs, and we do venture building, uh, studying social businesses from scratch um, for unaddressed needs. And the solutions are not only about um, waste management, meaning uh, the collection, the sorting, material recovery, recycling or composting, but also solutions that um, prevent waste in the first place or that offer products or services as a, as a, on a reuse or refurbishment model. And one of our contributions to the partnership is a tool that we are using for the incubation of social businesses, helping uh, businesses as well as citizens um, in developing um, a sustainable social business in, in, the, in the waste sector or the circular economy. And I will briefly um, present that tool to you. I will just share my screen. So now it should be visible. Um, Start Now is an online course in which um, we help participants to build um, their social business in, in waste management and equipping them with the necessary tools um, to track their future progress. And the whole process is accompanied by volunteer mentors that provide a constant feedback. Um, Fernando is um, from, from Africa and he is the founder of Luruku Service, which is um, a um, social business offering waste collection and composting services. And um, he has built his social business plan with the, with the help of Start Now. And the course has eight modules that basically guide the participants um, in getting started with their social business from understanding the problem that they want to solve, developing the value proposition, creating a stakeholders map, building the social business uh, model, um, uh, elaborating on the marketing and sales strategy, the social business viability, financials, and then eventually the steps for getting started. And um, just to give you some impressions on how this, um, how this looks like in reality, there's uh, the platform where people sign up online. And then uh, this is how the, the participants uh, dashboard looks like. And um, then they find the different um, steps of the process, instructions, call to actions. There's a help section where then someone um, from our team um, can also support. And um, uh, the sections where participants need to require their input at in the end of the entire uh, eight modules and the steps, the result of this will be a uh, ready business plan that they are able to, to implement. And um, uh, as I said before, I think um, this partnership um, uh, um, really brings in together uh, the complementary approaches from what um, Aditi and Cecily just explained with working and training uh, municipalities and officials in their task of waste management, UNOS Environment Hub, empowering citizens and the private sector for developing social business solution, and then all of it coordinated by UN Habitat and in bringing in institutional partners to um, facilitate um, those actions. And uh, this is yeah what, what the partnership is about and why we are um, happy to um, be a part of it and um, look forward um, to further discussions today and anyone who is interested in joining the partnership or working together with us. Thank you and over to you, Francesca. Thank you, Christina. Um, yeah, you are right. How are like, we are very complimentary. And it is really an exciting journey that we are uh, we are about to to start. Um, 
And thank you for announcing your upcoming co course and the tool of Start Now. I also take this opportunity to inform our audience that uh, uh, we are also soon going to launch uh, an online course that has been uh, um, developed with the support of the all uh, the, the partners uh, uh, of the founding uh, uh, members of the Wastewise Partnership. And before uh, giving the word to uh, Stefan, I would like to ask all our um, uh, colleagues, uh, um, the, the members of the Wastewise Partnership to uh, turn on the camera so we can take a picture. Unfortunately, we are not uh, together. So let me, okay, I would like to maybe, and can someone take the picture since I'm showing the screen? Maybe uh, Shavis. I think someone needs to um, make the, the other speakers visible because right now I only can see you, Francesca. Oh, I see you, Cristina, Aditi, Carlos, and Stefan, but I don't. Uh, Should I take a screenshot? Francesca? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Maybe. one, two, three, smile, everyone. <laughs> Okay, got something. Challenges with the pictures in the new in the COVID area. All right. Great. Then we look forward to, to to receiving the picture and thank you, Aditi, for for facilitating uh, this. And now I'm going to end it over to Stefan Bloom, who is the uh, project manager of the Reducing Plastic Leakage into the Ocean uh, Concepts for Sustainable Solid Waste Management from uh, GIZ. Thank you, Stefan, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Francesca. <clears throat> yeah, hello, hello, everyone, uh, dear ladies, dear gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear friends. It's my pleasure to, uh, to speak today to you on behalf of GIZ and the circular economy sector within GIZ. And I guess uh, we, we all agree that the circular economy bears enormous potential for, for both sustainable and inclusive economic development as well as climate protection. And that's one of the reasons why German uh, Development Corporation uh, is committed to support the development and establishment of uh, circular economy systems through multilateral and bilateral development cooperation with its partner countries. This cooperation focuses mainly on five uh, areas. First, a waste-free and healthy environment for people through effective municipal services. That's where we interlink very much with uh, waste cities and uh, waste partnerships. Secure jobs with decent working conditions. A third, sustainable production and reuse of waste as a raw material. Fourth, but protection by avoiding and recycling waste. And fifth, not, last but not least, avoidance of marine litter. German uh, Development Corporation supports at the moment about 20 countries worldwide mm -hmm. in their endeavors to unfold circular economy and reduce the pollution from waste. According to uh, the German Development Ministry's uh, 2030 reform strategy, circular economy will be or will become an integral part of our core area climate and energy in the action field of urban development. Cities are in the focus of, of our activities. Uh, we intend to increase support to partners countries interested to work towards a circular economy. Uh, for many cities in emerging and developing countries, um, one of the biggest challenges is the, the financing of waste management systems. Experience suggests that mandatory EPR systems extended producer responsibility systems can help to generate the necessary finance and capacity uh, capacities to increase as well as more and better recycling uh, to adapt a complex um, local uh, policy frameworks towards more circularity it needs international exchange and experiences multi stakeholder corporations and financial support are very um, helpful in that under the patronage of the uh, German Development Minister, 
Gerd the Prevent Waste Alliance was initiated in May 2019. Last month, Prevent celebrated its second anniversary. To date, more than 200 member organizations from private, public, academia, as well as civil society from more than 30 countries have joined this international mission towards more waste <laughs> prevention and circularity in lower and middle income countries. One of the main outputs so far is the EPR toolbox, which supports countries in establishing extended producer responsibility schemes. Yet prevent and waste wise cities platform already support each other strategically being active in the, in the advisory boards, but also on the ground in the field of data for development. Uh, in the development of the Waste by Cities tool and the Waste Flow Diagram for assessing plastic leakage. GIZ and German Development Corporation believes in the power of networks and appreciates the newly established Waste Wise partnership. Thank you for the great opportunity to share these thoughts in this distinguished forum. It goes to show that GIZ concepts are fully in line with Waste Wise partnership. Thank you, Stefan. For, for joining us and uh, for your remarks. We are very happy about also our collaboration and uh, how our Waste Waste Cities tool, the, the Municipal Solid Waste Assessment Methodology uh, is complementary to the Waste Flow Diagram uh, and then the data provided by the WACT, the Waste Waste Cities tool can be used to, to understand the, especially the plastic leakages of of the coming from the um, municipal solid waste uh, system uh, of, of a city. Thank you. Now I would like to hand it over to Oscar, uh, who is the, the lead um, of the plastic program at the World Wildlife Fund, uh, WWF. Oscar, you yeah, are welcome. Thank you, Francesca. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. So hello everyone. Uh, thanks again uh, for inviting me today uh, to this amazing uh, launch session, I have to say. So indeed, my name is uh, Oscar de Rose. I'm uh, leading the plastic program for WWF in the Netherlands. I'm based in Amsterdam. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to be part of the WasteWise partnership. Uh, so plastic waste uh, is our core focus uh, at WWF. Um, most of uh, the speakers today were talking about waste management cycles. In general, we tend to focus on plastic waste because this is choking our planet, polluting the air, our water and soil. So um, this crisis is even spreading uh, to every corner of the world. And WWF is helping reinventing how we source and design and dispose and reuse plastic materials. Uh, which many communities are still, of course, depending on. Because while plastic can still help make our hospitals safer and our food last longer and our packages more efficient to ship, uh, it has no place in nature, of course. So that's, uh, that's uh, where we uh, focus on. Every day, plastic is still flowing into our natural environment at actually an unprecedented rate. Uh, it's increasing rapidly. A dump truck, uh, actually, every minute into our oceans. Uh, and it's time to turn off the tap, of course. And that's something we hope, hopefully are going to do together, starting from today onwards. So WWF is uniting our global networks of industries, uh, leaders um, of large companies, consumers, of course, and policymakers to transform many of our production systems, so that plastic will, uh, that we still currently are discarding um, and consider as, as waste, uh, actually become um, a commodity and, and plastic eventually again. So as every uh, day people continue doing their part to reduce and reuse and recycle, also WWF is engaging with policymakers to ensure that plastic is leaving um, the recycling bin, bin eh, plastic is not uh, left out of the recycling bins um, and the effective waste management systems that are currently being built. Um, so we have actually built a network of plastic smart cities and that is something we add, I think, to the, to the partnership. Cities that are eager 
to identify the plastic leakage into the environment in, within their uh, city boundaries. Uh, and actually also cities that are working hard to solve the issue locally. So in addition, uh, we have a resource platform uh, established, um, a plastic activation hub, it's also called, uh, where we are helping some of the world's leading uh, companies translating their ambition uh, and plastic commitments into measuring change. Eh? So we have a tool, uh, both across the business operation, well beyond their supply chains, and we are working on the ground with local partners, for example, in Indonesia, Southeast Asia, but all the way up to Peru, uh, to keep plastic out of that plan, the, all these uh, extraordinary ecosystems. So WWF is fighting for a world with no plastic in nature, that's clear. In 2030, this is our goal. Um, it's a world where oceans actually team up again with marine life and nothing like the picture behind me. Huh? Um, no discarded nets, no bottles, no bags where these turtles are choked in. So also no humans, of course, should be breathing microplastics, nanoplastics into our systems. Um, so it's a world where people and nature are thriving together. That's that's us, that's the WWF, that's in our DNA. So once again, joining the WasteWise partnership is crucially important actually for us to expand our network, not only, but also to be able to include more specific waste management knowledge um, and expertise in, uh, into our work stream. We tend to focus a lot on biodiversity and environmental issues, but your content expertise related to waste management systems is crucial to eventually be successful in achieving our goals. So I can't wait, really, I can't wait to join forces with you uh, and really have impact together. So once again, thank you so much for uh, inviting us to the partnership and uh, looking forward to working together. Over to you, back to you, Francesca. Thank you, Oscar. We're also very excited to have WWF on board in this partnership. I'm sure that uh, uh, you're gonna bring uh, a lot of added value and looking forward to, to working together to achieve uh, waste uh, sustainable development goals, but also all the SDGs related to the uh, right to a healthy environment for, for every uh, living being on our planet. And now uh, we have another speaker, another partner. Um, before handing over to Andy Whiteman, the director of the uh, Waste Tower, I also would like to ask the, uh, the audience that if you have any questions, you can uh, type it in the chat and then we will have um, some time to go through the questions. So now I invite uh, Andy uh, to talk. Andy, Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Lovely to gather together. Uh, yeah, my name's Andy. Uh, I'm director of Waste Aware and also, uh, which is a non-profit organization working globally in, in uh, waste and resources management and also part of a, a, a larger cooperative uh, working in the sector, predominantly in low and middle income countries, uh, trying to tackle uh, the, the problems. Uh, we're practitioners in the field. We uh, we work from the ground level upwards and uh, and like to get our hands dirty and uh, and uh, this is where we uh, this is where we function best waste management or waste and resources management is is about uh, many different things is uh, uh, many different things to, to to look at many different drivers of uh, of change it's for it's about public health it's about ma maintaining uh, standards of public health and prevention of, uh, of uh, spreads of diseases it's also about both global and local environmental protection uh, uh, it's also about the green and circular economy it's about access to basic services and social justice essentially and it's also about business opportunities social enterprise development and, and livelihoods for some of the poorest uh, 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 people in the world. Up to about 30% of city budgets go for waste management services, which is a phenomenal money. If you, can you imagine, imagine that we're spending so much money on managing waste? And, and, and we know that uh, 
you know, that the 8 million tons of plastic entering the ocean has been a, a major, has led a major call to, to, uh, to action at the global level. Um, and we also know that the waste and the waste management sector is a major source of greenhouse gas emissions. And we also know that two to three billion people around the world lack uh, access to basic services, uh, which can be argued, and I would, uh, that is a basic human right. Um, these services uh, for the other, uh, 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 those certain people we have, are, are, are those services which we, we sort of get used to having and don't really notice most of the time. It's something you sort of, you take for granted after a while. Um, but actually amongst all these headline figures, it's, it's, it's also clear uh, to us who are working uh, uh, in the field that the basic data on waste management in, in cities is very, very weak. Uh, you can only manage what you uh, can measure and cities are, are trying to tackle this uh, uh, um, issue with very limited resources. And until now, there hasn't been a standard methodology for collecting data on waste management cities. And actually, that means we don't really know how big the problem is. And, and until now, we, there hasn't been, because of there's no gl global standard approach, until now, we haven't been able to accurately es estimate where the hotspots are, what the dynamics of change are. We don't know where global support and investment is most needed to fix the problem. Um, but now, with the creation of the WasteWise Cities tool, and accompanying methodologies, I believe we have a chance uh, if we band together and, and consistently apply uh, the UN Habitat's uh, leadership flagship uh, uh, Waste Wise Cities tool um, to understand and collect data uh, um, on, in the waste management in, in cities. Uh, working in waste and materials management, it's circular economy is an exciting and challenging field to work in. It, it's, it's a fairly young profession but young people are interested in working this field. So I think there's a great resource of people coming through the education system to come into this sector. And together, basically, we need to ramp up the resources coming into this area of work and move from data to tangible impact on the ground, reducing plastic emissions to the oceans and greenhouse gas emissions whilst creating opportunities for people to earn a decent living. Thanks very much. I hope that was five minutes. I wasn't sure I lost, lost track. I'm sure it was. Thank you very much, Andy. And for also touching upon the, the need of uh, a standardized methodology for the waste management. And I take this opportunity to also thank uh, Waste Tower and the team who is uh, uh, supporting um, supporting UN Habitat and uh, the other partners in the development of the, uh, the online course uh, from uh, uh, data to tangible impact, how to achieve uh, waste SDG by 2030. Um, so now at this point, I haven't seen any uh, question yet uh, in the chat. And uh, um, so I'm going to invite uh, Andre Zikus, the, the chief of the urban basic, sec urban basic services section of UN Habitat uh, for the closing remark. And I take this opportunity again to um, uh, thank all the person who have attended and also all the partners of the um, WasteWise Partnership, uh, UNOS Environment Hub, Afal Norge and Iswa. And also uh, WWF is gonna be uh, an, uh, a new uh, member of, uh, of the partnership. So without uh, any taking other time, I'm kindly asking uh, uh, Andre to, to join with, to give the closing remarks. Andre, Thank you. Are Thank you very much, Francesca and uh, colleagues. Congratulations for very efficient time management. So I think that's uh, good, good consumption patterns we're showing. Um, well, friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I'd first, of course, on behalf of Habitat, would like to thank uh, Professor Mohamed Yunus for 
hosting the global launch of this WasteWise uh, partnership here uh, during the 11th Social Business Day. And I was also very happy to be briefed by my colleagues about the uh, UNO Social Business Initiative, which they call the Three Zero Club, which is looking at uh, three zeros, one uh, zero net carbon emissions, the other one zero wealth concentration, and the third one zero unemployment. And of course, for us at UN Habitat, this is very much linked to our work on the localization of the SDGs, the new urban agenda, but also our work, um, our work program, specifically also the, the work program of the Waste by Cities uh, initiative and program, which we have. And of course, for us at the UN, it's always important to make sure that no one and no place is also left behind. Now, this initiative of the um, WasteWise uh, partnership is really coming at a, at a very important juncture in our time. Um, we have been going through and we're still going through the COVID pandemic. And this pandemic has really highlighted quite some inequalities in our world. One of these inequalities is access to, to vaccinations. And just to remind us in Africa, only 1% of the population has been vaccinated either with one shot or uh, fully vaccinated, whereas other parts and other cities show that they're actually vaccinated um, at 70%, uh, close to reaching herd immunities. And of course, during this pandemic, what we've also seen is that uh, a very few people have become richer and richer and others have actually lost in terms of wealth and, and assets at worth. Also during this pandemic, we have actually seen that uh, quite a number of people have also gone into unemployment and also have had to change um, their jobs. So I think it's, it's very much linked to, to our work. And of course, also what the pandemic has shown us, is, um, there is a disparity and discrepancy in terms of access uh, of basic services in our cities and also the provision of these services in a reliable manner. And specifically solid waste management um, has also been affected in terms of access, but also in terms of reliable services in our cities. So that's why I'm, I'm very happy that at this event, um, we've been, uh, uh, been able to join forces and to launch this uh, WasteWise partnership. And I see this something as a compact or a social compact, if we want to call that, um, where we all work together to really tackle this global waste crisis um, that we can contribute towards um, ensuring that we uh, have a cleaner and a healthier um, living environment we're in. So we're, from Habitat side, we're quite excited about the WasteWise partnership. And we're happy that Afal Noje, Iswa, and UNOS Environmental Hub have come together as, as partners on this um, to really uh, rally together in improving uh, municipal solid waste management and contributing towards circular economy. But we're also thrilled to see that there are additional partners um, you know, who stand ready to, to join the uh, uh, WasteWise partnership, and we're happy to hear that the uh, World Wildlife Fund is, is interested in, in engaging in this. We're also happy to listen to what GIZ and the Apfala Lands are doing, and also what WasteAware is doing. So we really look forward to, to rallying everybody together and really addressing these inequalities which have been exposed during this uh, COVID period, and hopefully as we, we build back uh, better um, after this pandemic, we can actually also address uh, better the inequalities which have been exposed. So with that, thanks a lot to all of you for coming together and, and launching this um, and really congratulations to everybody. And we look forward to really working with all of you in making this a success. Thank you very much to all of you. And thanks, Francesca. Thank you, Andre. And uh, I think we can conclude the event. Uh, once again, uh, thank you everyone for attending and happy Social Business Day. And we look forward to engaging more partners and working with cities uh, under the WasteWise uh, partnership. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.
Thank you. Bye-bye. Yunus Environment Tab team for putting together this session. Now I'd like to invite my colleague Zinat Islam um, to make some announcements of what's going to happen in the Social Business Academia Forum. Yes, uh, a big thank you to everybody for being there for all of the sessions today. Upcoming uh, is the Social Business Academia Forum tomorrow, the 1st of July. Uh, there are many sessions dedicated, especially towards the academic community involving uh, many academics from all over the world. So I request everyone to join our sessions tomorrow. Uh, there are going to be four plenary sessions, starting with the Social Business and Academic Curriculum and Course Designing. There will be um, sessions on the 3-0 club, the consultation on the 3-0 club, and YSBC's role as affiliating organization. Uh, then we will have another session on the social business research and collaboration. Finally, our last session of the day, on academia will be on the emerging research issues and research agenda on social business in East Africa. So there are many exciting sessions ahead of us um, and these are targeted especially towards the academics and students and young people to join. Um, it's open for everyone to join, but especially for those who are interested in academia and social business. Uh, so thank you very much. Another day, exciting day awaits you. So please do join us. Uh, check out our social business uh, pedia for updates on how to join the session. Our social media, the Unicenter Facebook page, the YSBC uh, Facebook page for the session recordings of the day. Um, thank you very much again. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye-bye.